Hello, thank you for joining our Better Business with Barnes podcast. My name is Mike Pappas, a director at Barnes Wendling CPAs. Today, we have Amy Vay, client strategist at BNY Mellon Wealth Management, an investment banking firm, is here with us to discuss investment strategies for single women, widows, and widowers, um, and the effects that it may have on, on the changing of their life as these financial challenges occur, especially after a loss of an individual or potentially a divorce or just, you know, a single women that are uh, need a little bit more financial information. So with that, Amy, will you share uh, your thoughts on how widows, widowers, single women can prepare for unexpected situations in their life? Absolutely. Um, first and foremost, if you aren't in that situation yet, then you are in you do still have a spouse, I urge you to attend all financial related meetings. Um, it is just, even if it seems to be over your head, find out who's the primary contact, meet regularly and understand your, the full financial picture, or at least get, you know, something of a grip of it so that it won't uh, lead to what we have seen among so many widows. Um, for instance, complete paralysis. Uh, we have some widows who, after they've lost their husband, they walk in with grocery bags full of their mail. And we're to go through it all and shred, throw away, keep, create those files for them. Um, and, and to this day, we still do it. Uh, some who have been with us for a few years, they still haven't got quite a handle on what it is document wise that they need to hang on to. Gosh, we've had some who are overwhelmed by the amount of saved documents. We've gone to widows homes to sort through old records. For instance, looking for cost basis on something, going through the sitting at the kitchen table and sorting through information for the accountant. And thankfully, there are firms like Barnes Wendling that have great client records, tax returns, and your organizer is always helpful in helping us decide what information is needed to, you know, th that they need to hang on to. Oh gosh, we had one situation too where the widow was learning of all different accounts that her husband had. We counted nearly 20 investment accounts all at different firms. So when he passed away, it was quite a challenge to change the titles of all of those accounts. Um, and it was many were with what I refer to as kind of the DIY firms, the do it yourself. So that left us with 800 numbers and endless hours on the phone trying to get accounts retitled and consolidate. So you know, that kind of, um, it, it, it can be overwhelming. So my advice is try to get organized as best you can. You know, you, you bring up a really uh, valid point that I think people need to uh, clearly understand, and that is to understand what you, you know, what a, a married couple has and where it's at and who to talk to. I know that uh, you mentioned a really good point about being involved in attending meetings. I, I, I think that is really right on point. I can't tell you how many times we have meetings that don't involve don't involve both the husband uh, and uh, the spouse and it's really problematic because when something happens um, you know they don't know what to do and that really leads us to our next point and that is the biggest concern uh, seems to be how much money do they have to continue to live on and spend you know you know what would an investment advisor do to help their clients in addressing spending there are, well, there are a lot of tools in the toolbox and, and obviously each one depends upon the individual circumstances, um, how old the person is, how much money they have. Uh, and, you know, and you the biggest place to start and any investment firm should be able to do this for their clients is to help them create a net worth statement. This is gonna list down all their assets, and how everything is titled. Because um, you got to get a handle on what you have, listing down. And this, you know, we help our, the, our widows and widowers do this, but it is something that is a task for just them because they've got to go through the, their records 
to find out what they have as far as cash, taxable investments, tax deferred. Those would be the liquid assets. And then look at the non-liquid. Do they have company restricted stock uh, or options, real estate? Is there, are there business interests or personal property? So that's the number one thing to get a handle on is just finding what's out there. Are there retirement plans, IRAs? Um, and once you have that, um, you gotta look at the liabilities. Is there credit card debt, mortgages, you know, lines of credit? personal guarantees on family or business loans. So getting a handle on that you, then leads you to what are their personal circumstances? Um, how much do they need? How much do they want to spend? Uh, gosh, we have seen people spend themselves into almost a zero balance. Um, and it's not because they weren't warned about it. Every investment manager has a tool to help create a net worth statement and then to do spending forecasts and balance forecasts. So we can put that money in, but the, um, the client has to be honest about spending. I helped one not too long ago kind of calculate what all she was spending and excluding the large purchases, one-time things, she was spending about 25,000 a month. And when I went over this at a meeting where her sons were present, they were aghast. Um, they couldn't believe she was actually spending that much because she always appeared fairly frugal. And you know, take into consideration, we've also seen widows who have adult children who are still asking for support. And that wears down and is a drain on a font. So we've got to take a look at all the spending and, um, and, and then run some forecasts. So in doing that, have you found that the, I'll say the person, your, your client that you're dealing with, are they surprised at when you put together the net worth statement and listing all the assets, either how much they have or how little they have? Uh, Yes, it, only in the sense that they've never seen it all put together before. Okay. Um, and it, it has gone both ways. Surprise on the, the good side and horror uh, on, the, uh, on the low side. Yeah, I could imagine that um, there would be a surprise. I know I had a situation earlier this year uh, where one of my clients, and actually it was his, um, his uh, mother-in-law, and uh, his father-in-law passed away suddenly of a heart attack. And, you know, they first are trying to assess what they have and, and life insurance and everything else. And, and she had a job, but, you know, she was not necessarily the, the breadwinner. But then to make an assessment of saying, okay, what do I need to do, right? What are my first steps? And very, uh, you know, very problematic for them because certainly they didn't anticipate this occurring. And then uh, when they come to analyze everything, realize that they probably didn't have as much liquidity as they thought, right? And yeah. so that was really a little bit uh, of an eye-opening experience. So it's, it, it, yeah, the more involvement, the better. I, I, I can't agree with you more on that. Um, in general, though, is there, is there a rule of thumb on spending, you know, on, as far as assets go? Yes, there, there kind of is as far as uh, if your one of your goals is to, preserve your principal. Um, say, for instance, if you're spending just 2% of all of your assets, which may or may not be enough, um, in 20 years, you should still have 85% of your principal intact, at least that much. But if you're spending 6%, just that little increase, uh, chances are you'll have 14% of your starting principal after 20 years. So it, you know, it's something that needs to be run every year. And we ask our clients be nimble. In times like this, when the market has been up, we are telling people, let's take you know, some of the gains off the table, put it in cash, and we'll put it aside for future spending in case the market is down next year. Um, so be, yeah, being nimble is really critical. It, you know, 
if you can. You know, and for some people, spending down their entire balance is just fine. But right. it all depends upon your age and how much you have. Right. Yeah. Make, makes uh, makes total sense. So do you do a, a like a total cash flow forecast, including other sources of, of income stream like Social Security and things of that nature? We sure do. We take their liquid assets, their retirement assets. We put input their Social Security, any pension assets put in the value of their illiquid assets and then run projections based on their uh, life expectancy and even extended life expectancy. And we chart it out to show them each year where the money's gonna be coming from. Will it come from your taxable assets? How much would be of your spending comes from taxable, tax deferred? And when you have to get into your illiquid asset um, so that they get an idea in case they don't want to touch the illiquid assets, sometimes it means cutting back a bit. So, you know, in the current environment, I mean, low interest rates have been around for, you know, well over 10 years now. You know, what options uh, should they consider in boosting income? Yeah, the poor, uh, very conservative savers have truly been punished over the past 10 years um, because the interest rates have been so darn low. CDs and bonds pay close to nothing. So we have transitioned many people uh, into dividend yielding stocks. And also one of the things people have to realize is you can take appreciation and live off of that. So we try to get our clients comfortable in more equities and then take appreciation, sell it. Yes, you have to pay some tax on the appreciation, but we'll make, try to make sure that it's long-term capital gains. And then in some cases, we'll do covered calls. Uh, this is an options strategy and a very conservative one. And this is, again, where we work with accountants to find out for our clients what their capital gains budget might be in case some of the stocks get called. But that strategy does provide a little extra income. And we've actually, and there are, you know, some who are very wealthy who don't want to take capital gains. And because the interest rates are so low, they are taking an investment line of credit and borrowing against their own assets for their income spending, for their lifestyle spending. So interesting. Yeah. So there are a lot of different angles you can try depending upon your own personal situation. Sure. And it, it, in general, are there, is there any order of assets that you look to liquidate, you know, first, second, third? Yeah, most definitely. Um, most people do want to put off the, any IRA assets just because they are 100% taxable. Sometimes it's a combination of both. But I just have to give an example of a woman who came to us about 10 years ago. Um, and 10 years prior to coming to us, she became a widow in her early 60s and was left with an IRA and a family trust. At that time, the attorney advised her to deplete the IRA first and not touch the family trust. When we spoke to her, she just couldn't understand why she was in such a high tax bracket year after year. And it's because every penny she used for spending came from her IRA, it was completely taxable. And then to add insult to injury, the family trust, as you know, um, creates you know, income because it's invested, yes. And unless that income is paid out to the beneficiary, it's taxed at the trust tax rate, which is 40%, even higher than the tax bracket she was in. She was nobody, the, the assets were at a small uh, bank and trust, and they never paid the income to her for 10 years. Oh my gosh. Oh yes. And when I spoke to the accountant, he had no idea that, the, that this family trust existed because the bank as trustee was filing the tax return. So this kind of leads us back to step one of prepare a net worth statement. Had that been on there, 
then the accountant would have been able to say, you know, what are you taking from here? You know, are they filing the tax return? And yeah, it was an unfortunate situation. So she, you know, when she came to us, we obviously corrected all this. So she's gone from a very high tax bracket down to, I think this past year, it was 6%. Oh my God. So yeah, the moral of the story is, you know, for these, for those who um, do have a fair amount of assets, or even if they don't, have a second set of eyes look at things right. for you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it makes it ma- absolutely right. It makes a big difference. Um, yeah, that's that's a very unfortunate situation, but those things occur. So, just dealing with the death of a spouse, though, I want to kind of circle back to this. What what steps can be taken to ensure an easier transition with the personal finances? Well, certainly have the accounts titled correctly. And if they're working with a trust and estate attorney, that's one thing that that attorney is going to be asking for. They first want to see, all right, what do you have and how is it titled so that things can transition easily. If it's an individual's name, they might have it transfer on death to their trust or who could have it titled in their trust. Um, when it's titled in just their name, as you know, that's going to go right to probate. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, so that puts you know, that that just makes things a little bit more difficult for the survivor of the couple. Yeah, and uh, you know, along that line, you know, with with technology these days, one of the things that I've uh, seen occur is that um, everything's online and digital. So, you know, the one spouse is taking care of virtually everything online and digital, and the other spouse doesn't know how to access anything, right? So that kind of gets a little problematic as well. Um, So we're trying to encourage people to, you know, create a list of where these things are at and any passwords or contact information. So it just makes it a lot easier for somebody in the event of an untimely death or situation. Yeah, it's, (laughs) it could be quite a mystery. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. And in in addition to even having a you know, list of the accounts, passwords and such, put together a list of the accounts and the primary contact for each person. Yep. Absolutely. Someone say, I have no idea who he was dealing with. Um, right. And, 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 you know, is it a reputable person? We had one client, this was so sad because two days after her husband died, the, an insurance agent was at her door selling her annuities and saying, oh, Joe would have loved for you to have this. He would have wanted you to have this annuity. So she was buying annuities just two days afterward, and she really didn't know the man. Oh, my gosh. So, yeah. And, 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 and as, as certainly, as you know, annuities are not necessarily the place to be. <laughs> yeah. It's, there's a right and a wrong time for them. Right. And yeah, every right. situation is different, but yeah, yeah. It, that was unfortunate. So in choosing, you know, when the, when the widower or single uh, spouse is in that situation and, and they have not been working with uh, an investment advisor, you know, what should they look for in a wealth manager or investment advisor, somebody in that capacity? Um. Look for a firm where you will have a dedicated portfolio manager and that that manager is your primary contact Um, and agree to a certain frequency of in-person meetings a year Uh, because the more your manager gets to know you, the the better he's going to be able to manage, he or she will be able to manage uh, the account to, to reach your goals. And I always like to tell people if they are single, bring along a trusted advisor. Doesn't have to be for every meeting, but right. I think, yeah, bring your accountant once in a while um, or bring somebody who's somewhat savvy in investments just so they might ask questions that the widow or widower might not think to ask. Make sure that the portfolio manager will agree to run spending forecasts and we'll communicate regularly. And when I say regularly, I mean, newsletters are great, but they're for the masses. You want some personal communication and also know the advisor's backup. This is, um, I have to share this because it was in a um, 
publication called Fun Fire uh, just a few months ago. And it, that's a um, newsletter for people in the finance industry. And there was an article about a Merrill Lynch broker in New York who literally was killed when hit by a bus. So when we say who's going to the backup when you're hit by a bus, it does happen. <laughs> So know that person's backup, you know, and try to learn over time. You're never going to get it all in the beginning, but learn about the firm's resources. You know, how deep is their bench? You know, what are the resources do they bring to the table? Those are all just some key questions that, you know, you can start to gather and learn over time. And like always refer uh, th this information to your trusted advisor. Well, this is this has been very, very valuable, helpful information today, and I'd like to just thank you for taking the time this this afternoon to join us, uh, talk about this very important topic that I think people often overlook. Um, people will be able to find this episode on our website for future listening at barneswemling.com forward slash insights. Uh, Amy, if people want to reach out to you though personally, what's the best way to do that? Uh, by either email or by phone. My uh, phone number is 216-593-2020. And email is amy.vey at bnymelon.com. Terrific, that is really great. Um, for all those listening, if you have not yet subscribed, uh, please do so. You can find our Better Business with Barnes podcast on Spotify, YouTube, and SoundCloud. And Amy, I just want to again thank you very much for taking time out of your busy day to share these value, very valuable insights. Always happy to help out. Great. Th thanks so much.